Now we'll look at some interesting and useful applications of eigenvectors. Let's start with mechanical engineering, specifically mechanical stress. When we apply force to a solid object, different points on the object may move in different directions based on where the force is applied and based on the material the object is made of. Let's use a specific example. Imagine we have a cylinder made of some uniform material like metal or rubber. We grab the two ends of the cylinder and twist in opposite directions. We don't stretch or compress the cylinder along its length. We just leave the cylinder where it is and apply torsion. Now if you draw grid lines across the cylinder, it becomes easier to visualize the deformation that occurs at any particular point along the cylinder's surface. If instead of just a point, I think about a short line segment lying on the surface, then as torsion is applied, this line segment might get stretched or compressed or might even get rotated. You can clearly see here that in many places, you're going to get some rotation. The question we want to answer is this. Where should I draw a short line segment so that it experiences no rotation? To solve this systematically, we use something called a Cauchy stress tensor, which is a tiny imaginary cube we place at a point of interest. In elementary physics, we usually just deal with point particles, but when working with real materials, when doing continuum mechanics, we need to take into account the thickness of our location of interest. So instead of a point, we use a tiny cube. As we apply torsion to the entire cylinder, each tiny cube of material will experience stress in many different directions, specifically three directions along each face of the cube. If we take into account some physical conservation laws, we can reduce all these variables into just nine distinct forces, which are represented by these sigmas. We can arrange these sigmas into a 3x3 three three matrix, which we call the Cauchy stress tensor. If we want to know the stress this tiny cube experiences in a certain direction, we simply multiply this Cauchy stress tensor by a 3 vector that represents our direction vector. The output vector we get is actually something called a traction vector. Basically this traction vector is going to tell you how your point in question is going to deform. Now we haven't introduced tensors and they're outside of the scope of this course. They're actually a generalization of matrices, but for our purposes, you can just think of the Cauchy stress tensor as a 3x3 three three matrix. Okay, so we want to find line segments along the surface of the cylinder that won't experience a rotation when we apply torsion. In other words, the line can get compressed or stretched, but it can't experience any shear forces. Well, this should sound familiar. We just need to find the eigenvectors of the Cauchy stress tensor. If we draw tiny squares on the cylinder, we can understand this visually. If we place square A, as shown here, the square is going to get rotated because of the shear forces. Square C, on the other hand, is oriented at roughly 45 degrees. Square C is going to get stretched along one direction and compressed along the other, but it's not going to get rotated. It won't experience any shear forces. There's a great video that shows this in action. I'll put a link in the description, but here's a screenshot. Imagine we have a stretchy, rubbery material, like one of those foam noodles you see at the pool. If you apply torsion to this foam noodle, the entire surface of the cylinder stretches, and it stretches pretty evenly. In this picture, we haven't twisted the cylinder at all. We've just drawn two squares like in the previous diagram. Once we apply torsion, the square on the left gets all rotated and distorted, and right angles are not preserved. But the square on the right experiences no rotation. It simply becomes longer and skinnier, like a rectangle, and all the right angles are preserved. The two lines bisecting the square on the right are the eigenvectors of the Cauchy stress tensor computed at the center of the square. Now the Cauchy stress tensor will be different for different applied forces, locations, and materials, but let's assume everything is held constant except for the material. It turns out that even for the same applied torsion, the stress tensor, and therefore the eigenvectors, can be different for different materials. This is important because the way that different materials fail depends on these eigenvectors. When too much torsion is applied to a brittle cylinder, the cylinder will fracture along a plane that lines up with the eigenvector corresponding to maximum tension. If we have a ductile material, like aluminum, the cylinder will fracture along a plane perpendicular to the length of the cylinder. But if we have a brittle material, like foam, rubber, or concrete, the cylinder will fracture along oblique planes. So ductile and brittle here have specific meanings. Even though rubber and foam are very stretchy and malleable, the technical term brittle applies to them because of their deformation characteristics. So eigenvector analysis of the stress sensor can help engineers design objects to withstand certain failures or to fail gracefully, whether it's a bridge or a car. Before we introduce the next two applications, we're going to learn what a Markov process is. It's a useful abstraction heavily used in many fields, 
but it's deceptively simple. Let's say we have three different states, A, B, and C. We get to define these states however we'd like. It could be as simple as a traffic light being green, yellow, or red, or it could be as complex as an aircraft being in one of three distinct configurations. We're just going to deal with abstract states for now. We also get to specify well-defined transitions from one state to another, each with a certain probability. We might be given these probabilities, or we might have to do some research and estimate them from data. The only requirement is that the sum of all the transition probabilities leaving a state must equal 100%. There might be a transition from a state back to itself, so this requirement isn't very restrictive. It's just saying the probabilities need to add up correctly. After all, you can either go to one of the other states, or you can stay in the same state. Those are your only options. You just have to be careful to define your states and transitions to cover all possibilities in your model. I've made up some transition probabilities here. For example, if your machine is in state B, the probability of going from B to A is 0.2. If you're currently in state A, the probability of going to state C is 0.4. One very important point to note is that the transition probability is only the probability of going from one state to another state in the next moment. You get to define what that next moment means, but it needs to be well defined. It can't be ambiguous. If you have a green traffic light, it's not going to suddenly switch to red. It has to turn yellow first. This would mean the transition probability of green to red would be zero. It takes two moments or two steps to go from green to red. If I color code the transition probabilities leaving each state, you can easily verify that they add up to 100%. For example, if you're currently in state B, the probability of going to state A in the next step is 0.2, the probability of going to state C in the next step is 0.3, and the probability of staying in state B for the next step is 0.5. These are all the magenta numbers, and they add up to 1. Although the diagram here shows only the probabilities of going from one state to another in the next time step, you can just repeat the process to find the probability of going from one state to another in two or more time steps. You just have to enumerate and add up all the pathways. For example, I can get from B to C in two time steps by going from B to C in step 1, then staying in C for step 2. The probability of following this two-step path would just be 0.3 times 0.2, which is 0.06. Alternatively, I can go from B to A in step 1, and A to C in step 2. See if you can find all the other paths. If you add up all these probabilities, you'll get the probability of going from B to C by any path in two steps. The procedure I just mentioned is correct, but you can see that it's really tedious. Imagine if we had 100 states instead of just 3. Thankfully we can use linear algebra to make this extremely easy. First, we can represent the current state we are in with a state vector. We just have three states in our example, so we'll use a three vector. If we're currently in state B, then the second element of our state vector would be one, and the other two elements would be zero. If in the next step we were in state A, then there would be a one in the first element and a zero everywhere else. But this only happens if we are certain about what state we are in. If we know for sure that we're in state B right now, we'd have the vector you see here, but instead, we might be making a prediction about the future, so nothing would be certain. We can instead place probabilities in each of the elements. Maybe several time steps from now, we might be very likely to be in state B, but it might not be absolutely certain. So we'd place some number close to 1, but not exactly 1, in the second element. There would be a non-zero chance of being in states A or C, so those elements would have small non-zero values. In order to denote which time step the state vector corresponds to, people often place the step index in parentheses like you see here for step 0. This isn't an exponent or a derivative, it's just a convenient notation for the time step index. Our second step is to define a stochastic matrix, which just contains the transition probabilities we have in our state diagram. The element in row i in column j corresponds to the transition probability from state j to state i. For example, the element in the third row, second column, is 0.3 because there's a 0.3 probability of transitioning from state B to state C. I suggest you take a minute to check if all the transition probabilities in the state diagram are in their correct places in this transition matrix. By the way, some people call the stochastic matrix a Markov matrix or a transition matrix, 
but stochastic matrix sounds cooler, so let's use that. Now the great thing about this formulation is that if we want to know the probabilities of being in any of the states in the next time step, we just multiply the stochastic matrix by the state vector of the current time step. Easy. If you check carefully, you'll see that matrix multiplication already takes care of finding all the different paths between two states and adding them together. If there's no way to get from one state to another, we just place a zero in the corresponding element of the stochastic matrix, and matrix multiplication will take care of everything for us. In our example, if we're in state B at time step zero with absolute certainty, we just need to multiply the stochastic matrix to get the state vector for time step one. The probability of going to state A would be 0.2, of staying in state B would be 0.5, and of going to state C would be 0.3. We just got back the transitions we already knew from the state diagram. But here's where things get interesting. If I want to find the state vector of probabilities at time step 3, I just multiply the state vector at time step 0 by the stochastic matrix 3 times. That's it. Matrix multiplication will automatically take care of enumerating all the paths between any two states. It'll multiply and add up all those probabilities correctly. Generalizing this, if you just want to know the state vector at time step n, you just multiply the initial state vector by the stochastic matrix n times. I mean, think about this. This is incredible. You don't need to look for all the different paths from one state to another. You don't need to worry about missing a path. You just multiply matrices. You don't need to think at all. That's amazing. Now I'm going to show you something really exciting. Although it's already really simple to calculate the state vector at any future time, we can make this calculation even simpler. Let's start with this equation again. From the spectral theorem, we know that every real symmetric matrix can be expressed as the product of three matrices where the matrix in the middle is a diagonal matrix. But our stochastic matrix isn't symmetric in general. So the spectral theorem doesn't apply here. But it turns out that it's possible for some non-symmetric square matrices to have eigen decompositions anyway. The catch is that the three matrices have complex entries and the matrix Q might not be orthogonal. It will be invertible, but it might not be orthogonal. Matrices that can be decomposed this way are said to be diagonalizable. So really the spectral decomposition is actually a special case of eigen decomposition. We're not going to learn about diagonalizable matrices in detail, but just know that a k by k square matrix is diagonalizable if and only if it has k linearly independent eigenvectors. That condition is often satisfied by stochastic matrices, and the stochastic matrix we chose for this example is also diagonalizable. For the rest of this video, we'll assume that any stochastic matrices we're working with are diagonalizable. Anyway, we can replace A with Q lambda Q inverse, where Q is an invertible matrix. Note that I'm being careful not to say Q transpose here because Q might not be orthogonal. Now instead of using the exponent, I can just write everything out n times. But do you see what we're about to do here? Oh shit, the Q inverses and the Qs line up right next to each other, so we can go ahead and multiply them together to get identity matrices. They disappear, and all we're left with are the lambdas. In fact, we're left with exactly n lambda matrices, and only the first Q and the last Q inverse are left. But why does this matter? We just have another matrix, lambda, raised to the nth power. We used to have A raised to the nth power. So what? Well, since lambda is a diagonal matrix, you can easily verify yourself that raising it to the nth power is the same as raising each of its main diagonal entries to the nth power, since all the off-diagonal elements are zero we can just bring the exponent inside and apply it to each element. We don't even need matrix multiplication. Now calculating the state vector at time n is even easier. This allows us to quickly deal with even bigger matrices, which means a larger number of states, and we can easily calculate state vectors many, many steps in the future. Let's look at some code and check if this really works numerically. First, let's see how to compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors in NumPy. It's very easy. I've created a square matrix and filled it with some numbers. This isn't a stochastic matrix, it's just a matrix I made up. I can call numpy.linalch.eig on this matrix to get its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are organized in corresponding order. So for example, the second element of the eigenvalues array corresponds to the second column of the eigenvectors matrix. I'm also passing the identity matrix to the eig function just as a sanity check. When I print everything out, 
you can see all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A, and running eig on the identity matrix also produces the output we expect. Now let's run a numerical experiment on our Markov process from earlier. I know the text looks small here, but in the description you'll find a link to the code, so you can take a closer look at it and run it on your own machine. At the top, I've got the same stochastic matrix A from before, and I've got the initial state vector x0, where I'm in state B with absolute certainty. I have the number of steps or transitions set to 10,000, so I'm interested in the long run behavior of this system. I want to calculate xn, which is the state vector at the nth time step, so 10,000 steps from now. I'm going to do it the relatively slow way first. This is still pretty fast, since we only have a tiny 3x3 stochastic matrix, but if we knew nothing about eigen decomposition, this is how we'd do it. We just multiply the matrix A over and over again 10,000 times, then multiply it by x0 to get xn. Okay, simple enough. In the second half of this code, we're computing the same final state vector xn using the eigen decomposition trick instead. We get the diagonal matrix from the eigen decomposition, and then the last for loop here, we just raise each element along the main diagonal to the nth power. We put the stochastic matrix back together and multiply by x0 to get our xn. We should get the same answer. Printing everything out, we have x0, and just as an example, we printed out x1 here as well, which would be the state vector at the second time step. Then we print out the final state vector xn obtained just by multiplying the stochastic matrix over and over again. After that, we print out the final stochastic matrix, which is just the matrix we get after multiplying the stochastic matrix with itself 10,000 times. Note that for each row, all the values are the same. There's something profound going on here that has to do with the steady state behavior of a Markov process. I won't go into any more detail about this here, but I encourage you to investigate why we see this structure in the matrix. Finally, on the last line, we've printed out xn again, this time computed using the eigen decomposition trick. Note that even with all the digits we've printed, the two xn's are exactly the same. Now we can apply Markov processes to some interesting applications. They show up in finance all the time, for example in predicting stock movements. I found an interesting blog post where the author builds a simple model for trading Apple stock based on Markov processes. The graph here shows Apple stock over a couple of years, and the time is color-coded into different regions based on how quickly or slowly the stock is rising or falling. For example, the times where the stock price is rapidly falling is in dark red, and the times where the stock is rapidly rising is in dark green. The lighter shades of green indicate more neutral or slightly positive stock movements. By splitting up time into seven mutually exclusive but comprehensive regimes, we can convert this continuous problem into a discrete problem with seven possible states. Just by looking at the data for each day and estimating the transition probabilities by counting up the actual number of times the stock went from one regime to another, we get the stochastic matrix shown here. We can learn a lot just by looking at this matrix. One striking thing we notice is that the elements along the main diagonal have the highest values. The stock has a very strong tendency to stay in its current regime. If the stock is rising today, it's probably going to keep rising tomorrow, and if it's falling today, it's probably going to keep falling tomorrow. Now this might be true from one day to the next, but for how many days can we expect the stock to stay in one regime? Well, we can easily calculate that by multiplying the stochastic matrix with itself over and over again and seeing what the values along the main diagonal are. Because we're multiplying probabilities over and over again, the probability of staying in one regime for several days gets smaller and smaller the more days we consider. Of course, if we consider enough days, eventually the probability will approach zero. Some regimes might approach zero more quickly than others though. For example, Regime 7, which is the regime of rapid rise, approaches zero much more slowly than any of the other regimes. So what the author of this blog post did is create a simple trading strategy where we redistribute our investment between Apple stock and some other very safe asset like an index fund or even just cash. I'm not going to read this whole strategy out. You can read the original blog post on your own later, but I'll just give you a taste of what's going on here. So we heavily invest in Apple when we're in one of the rising regimes, and we reduce our investment in Apple when we're in one of the falling regimes. Okay, this sounds like a really simple, dumb strategy, but the interesting bit comes next. Based on what we learned from Markov analysis, we start to reduce our investment in Apple if we've been in regime 7, 
the fastest growing regime for too many days, for 30 days specifically. On the other hand, if we're in one of the declining regimes for more than a specific number of days, we start to invest more in Apple. Basically, we start to invest the other way if we've been sitting in the same regime for too long. We're trying to anticipate a bull market or a bear market. This is a little smarter. If we actually run this strategy on the same data, simulating what it would have been like to use this strategy back then, we get the purple curve shown here. The actual Apple stock is shown in teal. This basic strategy based on Markov analysis consistently performs a little better than the actual Apple stock. That's pretty amazing. Of course, we're running the simulation on past data. We're evaluating on our training set, which won't tell us much, but at least we can see the theory at work here. This strategy probably won't do well on a different data set or on real Apple stock right now, but this analysis could form the basis for a more sophisticated trading strategy. Real trading strategies and algorithms on Wall Street make heavy use of Markov process theory. For our next application, we're going to look at red blood cell production in the body. So your bone marrow produces red blood cells. They travel around your cardiovascular system and do their thing, and they get filtered through the spleen. The spleen destroys a certain percentage of the red blood cells in order to remove unhealthy cells from circulation. But the more red blood cells the spleen destroys, the more the spleen releases a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO, which stimulates the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. So there's a closed loop here, and the bone marrow and the spleen work together to maintain a steady number of red blood cells in the body. Let's state this in more precise language and present the problem we're trying to solve. So RBCs are created and destroyed every day, but we assume their number is stable over the long run. The spleen filters out and destroys a fixed fraction of RBCs each day. We're going to assume this fraction is the same every day. The bone marrow produces new RBCs each day in proportion to how many the spleen destroyed on the previous day. We also assume this proportion is constant. The problem we want to solve is, what is the RBC count on the nth day? We can model this with some linear algebra. First, we're going to translate the problem statement into two equations. We have two variables, R for the number of RBCs in circulation, and M for the number of new RBCs produced by the bone marrow, and we can index these variables by the day. F is the fixed fraction of the RBC population that the spleen filters each day. So the first equation simply says the RBC count on day n plus 1 is equal to 1 minus f times rn, which is the number of RBCs not destroyed by the spleen the day before, plus mn, which is just the number of RBCs produced by the bone marrow the day before. We have one more equation, which says the number of RBCs produced by the bone marrow on day n plus 1 equals gamma, a constant proportion, times f r n, which is just the number of RBCs destroyed by the spleen on day n. We've got two equations, two variables, two time steps, so we can rewrite this as a nice matrix equation. We can compute r and m on day n plus 1 by multiplying a 2 by 2 matrix with the r m vector on day n. So if you're paying close attention, you'll notice this isn't really a Markov process. These aren't probabilities. The matrix here isn't a stochastic matrix. Still, the next day's values depend only on today's values. So we can represent the red blood cell production process with a matrix equation, and we can propagate this over many time steps into the future. Eigenvectors will help us out here. If we want to compute the state vector on day n in terms of the initial state vector on day 0, we just raise the matrix to the nth power as usual. It turns out that this matrix is diagonalizable and here are the three matrices. If you want to see how they computed the eigenvectors, please take a look at the original paper. Again, the great thing about diagonal matrices is that we can just raise each element of the main diagonal to the nth power. The top left element is 1, so 1 to the n is still 1, and in the bottom right we have negative f to the n. We're just interested in the variable r for this problem, so if we multiply out the top row, we get this equation. It's a bit complicated, but let's look at the long run behavior, the steady state behavior. F is the fraction of RBCs the spleen filters out and destroys each day, so we know it must lie between 0 and 1. Using this information, if we take the limit of Rn as n approaches infinity, then negative f to the n will approach 0, so the equation simplifies to this. The denominators are the same, so we can simply combine the two fractions like this. 
So this is interesting. The steady state number of RBCs in circulation depends only on the R on the first day and the M on the first day and on the filter fraction. It doesn't depend on gamma at all. I took this example from some notes from Princeton and if you read those notes, you'll see that the author points out why this model actually might not be biologically realistic. They propose an alternative, simpler model instead. On the other hand, if you search around for other papers on this topic, you'll find many researchers use more complicated Markov models to analyze red blood cell production. Finally, I'm just going to briefly touch on our last application, which is something called a landing ellipse. Here's an elevation map of Mars where NASA has landed several spacecraft. Each ellipse here is labeled with the year the landing took place, and you'll notice that over time, these ellipses are getting smaller and smaller. These landing ellipses represent the landing uncertainty computed by the spacecraft while it was descending. Back in 1976, for example, Viking had a huge landing ellipse, which means that the spacecraft's control software believed it had a 99% chance of landing within this region. As astronautics technology advanced, eventually in 2012, Curiosity had a much smaller landing ellipse with a major axis of 12 miles and a minor axis of 4 miles. There's a whole bunch of math and physics and software that goes into actually computing these landing ellipses in real time. Here's a nice graphic from NASA about the Mars 2020 rover. The landing ellipse isn't some static thing you compute beforehand. NASA engineers and scientists have some idea of what trajectory the rover should follow, but when the rover actually gets close to Mars, it continually captures new data and adjusts its trajectory to increase its probability of landing safely on the planet's surface. If we overlay the Mars 2020 rover's final landing ellipse on the elevation map, we see that it's even smaller than the 2012 Curiosity ellipse. Now there might be a bunch of equations involved in calculating this ellipse based on the parameters of the spacecraft, but here I just want to talk about the shape of the ellipse. In two dimensions, there's a simple equation for ellipses, but we could generalize ellipses to three dimensions or even more dimensions. Using an inequality involving a vector matrix vector product, we can very conveniently describe the region bound by what's called an ellipsoid, which is a multidimensional generalization of an ellipse. Think of a squashed sphere. We could represent 2D ellipses this way, but we can also deal with 3D ellipsoids or even ellipsoids in a thousand dimensions. So our vector x contains variables in as many dimensions as we like. So for example, in three dimensions, x could be a three vector containing Cartesian coordinates. The square matrix A contains constant values, and these are the coefficients we see in the ordinary equation for an ellipse. But the matrix A must be a symmetric matrix with a special property in order for this set of vectors to form a bounded ellipsoid. If you check the dimensions of this vector matrix vector product, you'll notice that the product is just a scalar. So if you plug in a 3D coordinate for the x vector and x transpose ax produces a scalar less than 1, then that 3D coordinate lies inside the ellipsoid. If it's greater than 1, the point lies outside, and if it's exactly 1, it lies on the surface of the ellipsoid. Now here's where eigenvectors come in. The eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the matrix A determine the directions and lengths of the semi-axes of the ellipsoid. If we want to make our landing ellipse small, our spacecraft's control system needs to make the eigenvalues of the matrix small in magnitude. We typically don't have direct control over the values in this matrix. The control system has to adjust the propulsion system, or the aerodynamics of the spacecraft, to indirectly reduce the magnitude of the eigenvalues. But in the abstract sense, that's what it all boils down to. As for the special property that the matrix A must satisfy for this set to form a bounded ellipsoid, We'll see in the next lecture what exactly this property is. Alright, it's pretty clear now that eigenvectors are super useful across a wide variety of domains. We've got one more lecture to cover before we finally introduce the SVD. Next time we'll cover two important concepts, quadratic forms and matrix norms.